Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page, and it's Wednesday morning, October 5th, 2022. Hope everybody's doing well today. We are back. Had to take the day off yesterday, but we're back to our studies. We started on Monday, a study of premillennialism, and so we're going to jump back into that today. And I've really tried to think a lot about how to best um, progress through this study. And hopefully I'll make some sense of that as we get started here today. But you notice the title of the video, Premillennialism, The Rapture. We're going to talk about the rapture. And I have a reason that I'm, that I'm doing it this way. So I will lay that out for you as we progress through the video. Let's see who we've got so far this morning. Diana, Jean, Lyle, Wayne. Good to see all of you who have commented. We've got others on the stream who are watching. And of course, we're also cross-posted onto the Near Churches page. And as always, if you have any questions or comments on either one of those Facebook pages, please uh, feel free to comment, and I will acknowledge them when I see them. Uh, looks like we've got Erna on our Near Churches page. Good morning from Canada. Well, good morning from Arkansas. Glad you're here. And uh, like I said, if you have any questions or comments, Please feel free to use the comment section. All right, let's let's jump into this. What I want to kind of do today, since we just started Monday and we took yesterday off, kind of re, um, kind of remind ourselves what we have learned so far. Just, so just it, by by way of basic reminder, Neil saying no sound. That may be on your end, Neil. I don't. I haven't received that message from anybody else. Hopefully, the sounds good. But uh, <coughs> as far as I can tell, we've got sound. Anyway, let's summarize premillennialism very, a very elementary way. I get it, but um, it's, it's effective. Okay, it lays out the points. Number one, primarily, Jesus came to earth. This is the premillennial thought. Jesus came to earth to set up an earthly kingdom, okay, a political empire for, Jew, for the Jewish people to push out the Romans, and to be ruler on earth, and to, to reestablish the Davidic throne, okay, the throne of David, that is. Um, okay, guys, thanks. They say the sound is fine. Thanks, Deborah and Lyle. Appreciate that. All right, so Jesus came here to set up an earthly kingdom to be a ruler on the earth. Israel rejected him, okay? We read the gospel accounts, and we see, by and large, the Jewish people rejected Christ, and so, in place of the earthly kingdom, until he comes back, he established the church. And then, one day, he will come back and will establish then an earthly political empire and uh, will have a national conversion of the Jews. In other words, the, the entire nation of Jews will come to believe in Christ and obey him, and they will rule over the earth with a rod of iron, and then he will return, and and well, then he will re, then he will reign in that way for a thousand years on earth, on the Davidic throne. So, like I said, I understand that's a very elementary, uh, fundamental definition, but that covers a lot of the bases. Now, there's a lot of in and outs in all of that, and so I hope in this series of videos that I can lay that out for you, uh, logically, effectively, so you can understand it. You know, the question is, you know, when we look at these other doctrines, I'm obviously I'm not a premillennialist. And so when we study these various doctrines, good morning, Sheila. One of the questions that comes up basically is, well, who cares? You know, what does it matter? Why do we bother studying all of these different doctrines that exist? Well, one reason is because if we believe error, it can cost us our souls. You know, there are some things upon which people can as we say, this doesn't even make sense, but we can agree to disagree, okay? There are some things that, like, there are issues of scruple, okay? Romans chapter 14, that, that we don't have to think the same thing on, okay? But then there are certain things that you have to believe are right. So let me, let me make that case for you just real quickly in terms of premillennialism at large, okay? Premillennialism tells us that the first time Jesus came, he came to establish a, an earthly political empire on David's throne, and that he failed. Now, they, 
a lot of times that language is not used. They'll say, well, he was rejected. Okay, well, so what? He was rejected. He failed. He didn't set up the earthly kingdom. It was unexpected that he would be rejected. It was unexpected that he would die. One of the reasons that premillennialism is a is what we call a fatal error. In other words, if you believe it, it will cost you your eternal soul. You will go to hell if you believe this doctrine. I cannot say it any plainer than that. One of the reasons that premillennialism is a fatal error that will cost you your soul is because it denies all of the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. The Old Testament tells us repeatedly that there was a servant of God who was coming here to die. That's why he was coming, okay? Case in point, Isaiah chapter 53. Premillennialism says, well, the first time he came, he came to set up a kingdom, but was rejected, and therefore he had to set up the church, and later he'll come back and set up the, the kingdom on earth. That doctrine is saying that Jesus failed at his mission, when in reality, that was not his mission at all. And so that's why it's important to study doctrines like this and others, but uh, like I said, I've had special requests to do this particular study because so many people believe it. But it is a, the, premillennialism is a doctrine that if a person holds to this, they will be lost because they are saying things that, that, that contradict Scripture, that contradict Old Testament prophecies, and the, in fact that, that contradict what Jesus himself taught and what the apostles taught in the first century. You cannot hold to things that contradict the teachings of Jesus and his apostles and go to heaven. You can't do it. So, let's, uh, let's look at premillennialism here now. I found this chart, and this was actually done by a premillennial source, and so this is, I'm not making this up, okay? What we're studying is entitled dispensational premillennialism. Like I told you Monday, that's, you know, that's a $5 phrase there. There's a lot to that, a lot of letters and syllables there. What does it mean? Well, dispensation, okay, that's, that's a reference to different periods of time. Premillennialism is the idea that there are going to be things that happen before Jesus comes back to earth for the 1,000-year reign. One of those things is the rapture. So let me lay this out for you. So if you look, I'll use my cursor here. Right now, we are in what is called the church age. You can see on the map here, map, whatever, this little diagram Dispensational premillennialism divides human history into seven dispensations of time, seven different periods of time, like from creation or from innocence to sin, okay? From, that is from the creation to the sin of Adam. That's, that's dispensation one. Dispensation two goes from Adam to Sinai. And so they have time divided up in seven different dispensations or periods. And today, as of right now, we are in the church age. And why we're going to start out at the rapture, talking about it today, is because according to dispensational premillennialism, that's the next thing that's going to happen. So you and I are in the church age, all right? At the end of the church age, the rapture is going to take place. Well, again, what is the rapture? We'll talk about that in more detail here after this slide. We'll go to another slide. But in, in, in again, fundamental terms and a very basic definition, the rapture is the secret coming of Christ where he will come for his saints. Jesus will come back secretly, not visibly, not audibly. He's going to rapture the church from earth. And for a period of seven years on earth, there's going to be a tribulation. Now again, and as I said Monday, depending on which branch of premillennialism you're talking about, some people divide that seven years into two three-and-a-half-year periods. They'll say the first three-and-a-half years are on earth are the tribulation, the second three and a half years are the great tribulation. Whatever the case may be, after the rapture, Christ coming for his saints, on earth is going to be the great tribulation. They use Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. <clears throat> Daniel's 70th week, we'll, and we'll talk about that in the future. And they say that's the seven years on earth of tribulation. But while there's tribulation on the earth, the saints are in heaven getting prepared for the 1,000-year reign that will come. They're receiving their assignments, if you will, for the upcoming kingdom. And there's, th this is when the marriage feast is going to take place, the marriage feast of the Lamb. And uh, at the end of those seven years, Jesus is going to return with his saints. 
And it's at that point in time, we're going to have the Battle of Armageddon, supposedly. Armageddon's mentioned only in Revelation 16, verse 16. Um, this is going to be the judgment of the saints. The kingdom at that point in time is going to be established. The Jews are all going to return to Palestine. They're going to inherit the land. And Satan's going to be bound, and Jesus will reign on earth for 1,000 years. And that's all of this information right here. There's going to be peace on earth. Um, Isaiah chapter 11 is often cited for this 1,000-year reign. Like I said, we're going to deal in detail with all of this in the future. I'm just laying the basic case out for you now for the rapture. You and I, according to this theory, right now, we are in the church age. The next thing, according to dispensational premillennialism, that's going to happen is Christ is going to rapture the church into heaven, the tribulation on earth, and the saints are going to be in paradise for seven years. So let's talk about the rapture. That, because that's the, in, in, their, in their doctrine, that's the next thing that will happen. That's the next, let's say, dispensation, next period of time. First of all, rapture, okay, that term is not a biblical word in our English versions. And so, well, okay, then where, where do people get this idea of a rapture? I'm turning back in my Bible, by the way, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, because this is the text that they use. It's in 1 Thessalonians 4. If you follow along in your Bible, get it out here. Deborah says, some say there will be peace. Others say it's going to be chaos. Well, supposedly, the, the peace is in heaven and the chaos is on earth. But again, it, that's not even consistent among premillennialists. It just depends on which kind you're talking to. Because there are many, as I said Monday, there are many different tentacles to this, to this overall doctrine of premillennialism. Patrick from Kenya. Good to see you on here today, Patrick. All right, so rapture is not in our English Bible. Now, here's where that word, um, here's where that word rapture does come from. It comes from a Latin translation of Scripture, in First Thessalonians four and verse sixteen. The Latin word is rapio, and so people teach that since that term is used there in that Latin version, that that is the rapture. So listen to this: First Thessalonians chapter four, and I'll just start reading in verse fifteen. It says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. This is the rapture, supposedly. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Now this is interesting because in, in a majority of dispensational premillennialism, they tell us that the rapture is secretive. That it's just, that the, that the as I say here on the slide, that it'll be a secret return of Christ to snatch away the church from the great tribulation on the earth for seven years. They're going to be in heaven at peace <clears throat> and getting prepared for the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. And they use 1 Thessalonians 4, I was saying verse 16, they use 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, which says, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Okay, this is the word that in the Latin version is rapio, and they get the word rapture. In the Greek, the word is harpazo, and it means to snatch away, to pick up, to carry away. That's what it means. But you notice here what's going to be going on, or what will occur when that catching up takes place. Um, the Lord himself will descend from heaven, okay, and notice the emphasis there. The Lord himself, this is a personal return of Christ. And and we'll, we'll deal with other passages in future videos about the return of Christ. But the Lord himself will return. But notice how. With a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Listen, that is anything but secretive. That is anything but a quiet, unknown event that's going to just, just snatch the church out of earth and take them to heaven. He's coming visibly and noisily, noisily, is that a word? He's, it's going to be loud, okay? Uh, caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Okay, so if, we're, if the church is going to be caught up in the air, how is that secret? If it's coming, again, with, with the noise that this text says, how is that secret? So here are the problems with this rapture doctrine, and there are many. <clears throat> but I just want to lay out a few. All right, so I'll just put all the verses up there at once. 
in terms of Christ's coming, we're told the nature of his return, okay? Premillennialism, dispensational premillennialism, has him coming at the rapture secretly. They have him coming again seven years later. So the rapture is like the first phase of the second coming of Christ. That's how it's termed sometimes. The rapture is the first phase of the second coming, and then his return at after seven years when the Battle of Armageddon is going to be taking place in all of this, that's his, that, that's the final phase of his second coming. D does the Bible, the, the question is, does the Bible represent a multiplicity of final returns of Christ? Second comings, if you will. Listen to Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. Now, when he had spoken these things, when they, uh, while, and, and this is the disciples witnessing the ascension of Christ, when, they, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as, as he went up, so they're watching him ascend. Okay? Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up in heaven? Listen, this same Jesus. Remember what 1 Thessalonians 4 says. The Lord himself shall descend. Well, the question then is, well, how will he descend? Acts 1.11 answers that for us. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. It was His departure, his ascension was visible. His return is going to be the same way. That's one of the problems with the rapture. It's not secretive. <clears throat> I've got a comment here. David says they teach that the tribulation is for it. And like I said, we keep talking about the tribulation and all that. We'll do videos. I'm going to do videos on all of this. But he says they teach that the tribulation is for Israel. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah, they get that from, what is that, Jeremiah chapter 30, I think it is. And the Antichrist will be in the Middle East, specifically in Jerusalem. Yeah, it, there are a lot of tentacles, as I've already said. So there's a lot to this doctrine. But anyway, thanks for the comment, David, and for watching. Um... Acts 1 and 1 Thessalonians 4 both tell us that this return is going to be visible. He's coming with the clouds as he left with the clouds and the disciples saw him go into heaven. That's not secretive. All right, so the second passage I have on here is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So, you know, normally I have the biblical text up here, but since I've got my PowerPoint, I don't. I'm sure there's a way I could do that. I'm just not smart enough to figure it out, or at least I haven't taken the time to figure it out. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7 talks about when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. He's not coming alone. He's not coming quietly. And he's not coming in, in a way where he cannot be seen. As he went up, so he's going to return. And here you have it referred to as the appearing of Christ. And it's termed that way in other passages as well. Um, well, the next one, 1 John chapter 2, and we just finished our study of 1 John last week, but listen to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28. John says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. His appearing and his coming, it's the same thing. And whether you're talking about premillennialism or even to some extent the AD 70 doctrine, um, uh, what's it called? Preterism. They try to differentiate between these words that are translated appearing and coming and revelation and the Bible doesn't do that. But see, to maintain their theology, to maintain their doctrine, they have to make these words um, apply to different, uh, d different events in history. But the Bible never makes that differentiation. The, Christ's revelation, His revealing, His appearing, His coming, it's all one event. And it's all going to happen at the same time. There's no idea in Scripture of a seven-year period between His first first phase of his second coming and the final phase of his second coming. That's just not in Scripture. Gene asks, when and where did this doctrine get started and by whom? I can tell you kind of the when. It, it, it's an early 19th century doctrine. And I was actually reading about this a bit last night. Um, I can't remember the individual's name, but it's an early 18th, uh, I'm sorry, early 1800s, early 19th century doctrine. I'll get that information for you, and I'll have it, I, I tell you what, I'll talk about th that tomorrow 
gene on on our video. You know, where where did this doctrine come from? All right, so Titus uh, Titus two thirteen is the next passage. Uh, listen to this. Um, well, I, I hate to jump just in the middle of a text, but that's what we're doing here. It's talking about how Christians are to live soberly, righteously, and godly. Well, why do we live soberly, righteously, and godly? Titus 2.12. Because verse 13 says, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, there's no indication of the first phase of His appearing and the second and final phase of His final appearing. There's just the appearing of Christ. There's the coming of Christ, the return of Christ. Um, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28 talks about this. Let's see here. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, well, that would be the Christian. And we just, in fact, we just read about that in uh, Titus chapter 2. Those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. He's going to appear a second time. Not a first phase of a second time and then a final phase. That would be the third time if that were the final coming. The, you know, the first time Jesus appeared was here on earth, born of a virgin, um, born in Bethlehem of Judea. And his second coming, it's what Peter, or, or rather the author of Hebrews talks about here, his second appearing is yet future, okay? And then, of course, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where we started today, um, let me get back there, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. And again, this, the, the, this is the problem, among many others, of the rapture doctrine. There is no secret coming of Christ. Remember Acts 1, as you saw him go in the clouds, you, you saw that he's going to come in the same way. And then you have this verse here. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. There is no secret coming. There is no first Charles Parham. You know, Sheila, that name sounds familiar, but I just can't remember at the moment. Um, we'll deal with this tomorrow, in tomorrow's video, the origins of this doctrine. But this idea that this rapture, that, that Jesus is going to secretly snatch away the church from the earth, is not anywhere in Scripture. His, his return is going to be visible. It's going to be the Lord Himself 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Acts 1.11, This same Jesus whom you saw go into heaven will come in like manner. He's coming the same way. He is coming the same way. And it's not secretive. There were eyewitnesses to his ascension. There's going to be noise. And everybody is going to be raised. There's not a, there, there's not a, a resurrection for the for the righteous at one point in time, and then another point in time, a resurrection and return and judgment of the unrighteous. It's all going to happen at the same time. So that's just an introduction to the rapture and to show you it's not a biblical doctrine. It's, it's not. Um, it, it's the, 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 the nature, supposedly, of the rapture is not taught anywhere in Scripture in these passages that deal with the coming of Christ. And all of these words, his revelation, his appearing, his coming, his return, however you want to say it, it's all talking about the same event and one event. So hopefully that's helped you a bit on the rapture. So let's do this tomorrow since a few of you have asked about this. Let's deal tomorrow with the origins of this doctrine, when and where and who, because that's important to do too, because it's kind of like uh, Jesus asked his questioners the baptism of John. Was it from heaven or from men? We need to do that with every doctrine. It, did this originate with men at some point in history that can be pinpointed? Or did this originate in the Word of God? So let's do that tomorrow. All right, guys, thanks for watching today. I really appreciate it. Um, it's Wednesday, so if you're somewhere that does not have Wednesday night services, we'll be here tonight at Mammoth. We're going to be doing an overbook of the view, an overbook, an overview of the book of Philemon in our adult Bible class, and that's 7 p.m. Central Time. All right, guys, hope you have a good day, and hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock.